Welcome everybody to the public webinar on the stock control and droving bylaw. Um, we're here today to just have a chat about um, what the content of the bylaw and to have a chance for all of you to give your feedback and ask any questions. So before we get started, just some introductions. My name is Claire Scott. I'm a transport planner at Tasman District Council. And I'm also here with Dwayne Fletcher, the strategy and policy manager, and Jamie McPherson, the transportation manager at TDC. So just um, a bit of housekeeping, um, just so everybody knows that the webinar format, so everybody is on mute and all, um, all the conversation will go on through the chat function. So if you've got any questions at all, just go into the chat and put your question in there and once I'm done with our little presentation, we'll go through and I'll try to answer all those questions uh, the best I can. So we'll start off now. Um, so draft stock control and droving bylaw. It, it, it is replacing a, um, a previous bylaw that, um, that came out in 2005. And for the last five years, there hasn't been an active stock control and droving bylaw. So this is a new bylaw, but it's sort of based um, a little bit on the old one that we had with some changes. So in the presentation today, we're gonna go over the background of the bylaw, where it's come from, um, what's, what it covers, why we have it at all, um, why we're updating it, and what the main changes are from the previous bylaw. And then at the end, what the consultation and submissions process is, if any of you or your organizations want to put in a submission on this. Um, and then we'll go through and take your questions. So as I said, the previous bylaw expired in 2017. So for the last five years, there hasn't been an active bylaw controlling this activity at all. Um, and it needed some changes to begin with. Anyways, it needed a bit more clarity about what activities uh, in terms of stock droving and crossing were permitted and which, uh, which needed a permit. Um, the 2005 bylaw didn't have a whole lot of detail on that and it was a little bit unclear. So this one um, adds a bit, more, a bit more specificity about what's required. And, um, and the previous bylaw also did not align with what's now considered best practice for road safety. We also needed to make sure that the bylaw aligns with um, the new standards in the National Policy Statement on Freshwater Management, which again wasn't a consideration back in 2005 when the previous bylaw was written. So, what does the stock bylaw cover? Um, it has two key functions. The first one is keeping road users safe. Uh, so that's everybody that uses the road, including, including the farmers uh, and also people driving, walking, cycling, anyone that might be using the road. Um, second, um, second key factor is keeping the roadway and the nearby waterways clean and as free as possible of stock effluent. So to go into the first one a little bit, in order to keep road users safe, the bylaw goes into some detail about what the requirements are for um, for fencing, times of day, daylight, when stock crossing is allowed, the number of stock that's allowed to cross at one time, uh, signage requirements, which is one of the key changes between the two bylaws, which is um, something we'll cover a little bit later. Uh, the responsibilities of the people droving the stock, um, the requirements to repair any potential property damage, both public and private, um, and what happens when there's a failure to abide by the safety requirements. In order to keep the road, the road, um, the road and the waterways clean from stock effluent, this new bylaw has a bit more detail about cleanup requirements and also uh, makes, makes it a bit clearer about what council can require in terms of cleanup if farmers uh, don't clean up to council standards um, after their stock have crossed or been driven down the road. So to go, to go into the, the road safety factor a little bit, there's some key, key risk factors that, um, 
that are at play when we're talking about this activity. And uh, NZTA, or now Waka Kotahi, has identified that from the few crashes that have happened from this activity, that there's been two main things uh, causing those crashes. And that's not having enough warning distance and that the forms of warning, so the types of signage aren't consistent. So road users don't know what to expect. Um, and there isn't there isn't a common sign that's been used um, to tell to tell drivers what's upcoming on the road. Um, the other key factors um, are the location of the animals, where they are on the road, are they on the side, in the middle, uh, visibility of the animals, the speed of traffic, uh, how much traffic there is, and how many stock are crossing. So those are all pretty common sense. Uh, obviously, if there's less visibility of the animals and it's a bit darker at dawn or dusk, um, then there would be a higher chance of an accident happening. So now I just want to go into a little bit of detail about the changes uh, between the 2005 bylaw and the draft 2022 bylaw. So the first one would be in terms of signage requirements. So the 2020, the 2005 bylaw was pretty vague about where signs needed to be placed. Um, it didn't go in. It didn't have a didn't have a clear system of deciding. Um, depending on the road where the signs needed to be placed to to keep both the stock and the farmers and the drivers safe. Um, and there wasn't a, there wasn't clear, it just wasn't clear what the required distance was. In the 2022 bylaw, it's quite clear that signs need to be placed three times the speed limit in meters um, away from where stock are being crossed. Um, and in order to help with this, there's also some visual guidance from Waka Kotahi that's being provided um, as, a as a schedule in the bylaw um, to help understand what those distances need to be and where the signs need to be placed. So it's just a bit, again, it's just adding clarity and bringing those um, stopping distance standards up to best practice now in 2022. So in terms of stock effluent, the next, the next key change uh, in, the, in the previous bylaw, the requirements on how to clean and to what level things needed to be cleaned up on the road was pretty vague. Um, and the language that was used was not legally binding. So it was phrased in a um, consideration will be given to doing X, Y, and Z rather than um, farmers must do X, Y, and Z. Um, there was also no mention of Te mana o te wai, the overarching principle of um, maintaining clean waterways or freshwater guidance in the 2005 bylaw. Now in this draft 2022 bylaw, the requirements are clearer. The wording is clearer. Um, it's written into it that the stock effluent needs to not be washed into roadside wetlands or streams. Uh, and one of the ways to do that um, that we acknowledge has caused a bit of concern within the farming community um, is to hold hold stock back 50 meters before crossing to give the stock a chance to release the effluent prior to crossing the road. Um, I'm not a farmer, we're not farmers, and this is part of the reason why we have this consultation process to hear from people um, that know, and we're quite keen to get your feedback on this and make sure that the the bylaw that's finally approved is um, is workable and uh, realistic and practicable for farmers um, doing their daily work. So the the wording is stronger; it's more legally binding. But it's actually what's required. You know, what's suggested is not actually that different from the two thousand five bylaw. It's just how it's been phrased. Uh, another key change is permits. Uh, the previous by law had um, information about what requires a permit in different sections throughout the bylaw. And it was a little bit difficult to pick to pick out and find who needed a bylaw or what activities needed a bylaw. The 2022 draft bylaw has quite a clear, uh, robust explanation about what needs to be what needs to be done and what's required and what activities do need to have a special permit in order to do them. Um, and lastly, is in terms of visuals. In the previous bylaw, there were no visual, there were no visual, um, there's no guidance given to farmers to help see 
um, to, have, to have a visual um, way of um, understanding the requirements in terms of signage, um, distance for stopping, pilot vehicles, where things needed to be placed uh, in order to be in line with the bylaw. The 2022 bylaw um, has all of that, has the, the current best practice guidance provided by NZTA. Uh, so that's a, it's an NZTA document and road controlling authority forum document about <clears throat> what's considered best practice and where things need to be placed. So hopefully that will be something that will help um, help farmers understand what, where things need to go on the road and make it just a little bit clearer and more usable. <laughs> Excuse me. This is just an example of that visual guidance. Um, as you can see it, <coughs> sorry, I got a bit of a cough. Uh, so it shows both in words and um, an image about where things need to go. So I'm just gonna have to go and get a little drink of water. <laughs> Apologies, I'm still just at the tail end of a cold that's been going around my family. So that, <laughs> lastly, I want to take you through the timeline about uh, when um, when the consultation process is finishing and what the process is after that. So this bylaw is out for public consultation until the first, <laughs> first of August. We've got the webinar we're doing right now. And then we're proposing doing hearings and deliberations in August, and then bringing the final um, draft to the council for approval in September. So these dates here in this timeline are still waiting for approval by council. <coughs> the previous timeline was a little bit longer, um, going till after the election and put, going into the new year for the final approval. But in order to get um, everybody's concerns addressed more quickly um, and to make sure that this process um, you know, just closes out well and doesn't drag out too long. We're requesting to bring that forward a little bit so we can finish it in September. So how to put in a submission. Um, we do really wanna hear from you. As I mentioned before, um, this is an important part of the consultation process is making sure that what we're proposing is actually workable for the community. So we do want to hear from you. Uh, so you can put in a submission online or um, you can download a paper copy or pick one up from, um, from your local council office. The link is there. We can also email it to you if you want. It's just on the council website under uh, my council and public consultations. And if you want to, you can uh, check to speak to your submission. So you can come into the council chambers and, or on Zoom and um, have five minutes to talk to your submission in front of the councillors as well in August. So that just about closes us off. Um, I see there's a few questions in the chat. I haven't looked at them yet, um, but I'll have a look at them now. Uh, so we'll just have that question and answer period, uh, answer period now. Okay. So, Um, first question is about the difference between droving and crossing in the bylaw. Um, there is two different sections within the bylaw about requirements for uh, droving stock along the road in a race and crossing the road. Uh, I, I have to tell I can't tell you the number off the, off the top of my head, but there is two different sections within the bylaw about those two activities. But if that's not uh, if that's not clear enough in the bylaw, um, please do put in a submission about that. And that's something we could um, just go back and check and make sure that we've made it really clear that there's a difference between the two activities. Um, question here about how many accidents have occurred due to this activity since 2017. I can, um, um, I can probably talk to that one, Claire. Yeah, sure. Um, Jamie, jump in here. Yeah. Hey, Ted, thanks for your presentation so far, Claire, and, and thanks, everyone, for uh, for joining us this evening. So um, there's been at least one, and uh, and I know this because we 
uh, we went through a bit of a rigmarole over this crash um, last year. So in in March of 2021, there was a, um, a couple of motorcyclists who were uh, riding along Marawere Saddle Road uh, near Murchison, uh, just enjoying themselves. They'd just been over the, the saddle section and we're heading towards the highway. And the, a farmer who farmed both sides of the roads uh, along the flat section before you get to the highway, he had left a couple of wires up across the road. And uh, one of the motorcyclists or the lead rider uh, didn't see these wires in time and he, he hit them at speed and they threw him off his bike and into a, into a post. And he, was, he survived, but he was badly injured. Um, and yeah, WorkSafe got very interested and the council got very interested and um, it was an interesting process all round. And WorkSafe are in fact now prosecuting the, the farming company and they, they don't tend to take many prosecutions, so they see it quite seriously. And we had a real think about um, how and why that happened and what the council could have perhaps done differently in terms of how activities occur on our road and how much knowledge we have of those. And, and you know, our council felt that having a bylaw in place would make it a bit clearer to, to everybody what, what good looks like, what safe looks like, and um, just doing our best to uh, keep our yeah, all of our road, road users safe. So, you know, there are things that we can all do to, to help keep people safe. So that's the one crash we know about because of the reasons I described. And um, But there is a bit more of a wider issue of, um, we get a few complaints a year about the condition of some stock crossing places on roads. Uh, there's uh, at least one in Golden Bay at the moment that we're uh, looking closely at. And, um, you know, they, they can be a hazard. And, it, you know, it only takes you know, one sloppy uh, uh, occasion and, um, and literally, you know, people, people can come a cropper. So, you know, we want to get ahead of the curve. We want, um, we want to be doing our best. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers that question. Cool. Thanks, Jamie. I hope, yeah, hopefully that answers that question. Um, a question here from Adrian. Does TDC have the jurisdiction over state highways um, in the district? The answer is yes, they do. Um, Waka Kotahi has given control for this activity on state highways to Tasman District Council. So this does cover state highways as well. Uh, next question about underwash power is council attempting to regulate um, fresh water in a council bylaw. Uh, we have taken legal advice about this. I might leave this to Dwayne to answer um, if he wants to step in here. Yeah, um, uh, kia ora, good evening, everybody. I'm Dwayne Fletcher, the Strategic Policy Manager at Tasman District Council. Hopefully you can all hear me. Claire, can you confirm? Roger, thank you. Yeah, so um, under the National Policy Statement um, for Fresh Water, it affects anybody who has um, in the future potentially has land um, where they have some degree of control over that land and, and therefore what happens on it and, and any um, environmental effects that may happen on it. So um, as you've pointed out, as a road controlling authority, we're trying to manage the impact of the activity on the road on um, fresh water. And the only way we can do that is, is through our bylaw. Um, and it's to make sure that at some stage in the future, well, in terms of the highest level thing, it's to make sure that we're trying to give um, um, give effect to that NPS um, through council's activities, regardless of whether directly related to the RMA or not. So the intent is to keep our freshwater um, bodies clear of effluent, and and we're trying to do that through here. The mechanism we do it um, is through the RMA. What we're not trying to do through the bylaw is act in a quasi RMA capacity. Um, so we're not trying to, um, you know, provide some of some sort of quasi consent or anything like that through the bylaw, but simply regulating activity on on the um, public roads, which council manages um, through the bylaw. Great, thank, thanks, Dwayne. Hopefully that answers the question. Again, if you have any more, if you want questions answered in any more depth, feel free to put in a submission about that as well. Um, so this isn't doesn't need to be the end of the road for any of these questions. You can always write in more about it as well. Uh, moving on to the next one, uh, 
comment about the consultation period being challenging in the middle of calving and lambing season. Um, apologies for that. Uh, I personally wasn't aware of that. Um, I'm sorry that it's, it's putting more on your plate at the moment. Um, hopefully the, the submission process won't be too difficult. Um, it's a pretty simple form online. Um, but yeah, you can always feel free to give us a call if you want to try to, if you want to send an email instead, um, you're welcome to do that. Um, yeah, and, and uh, hopefully that will, hopefully that won't be too hard to get that in, but apologies for having it during that time. I wasn't aware of that. Um, I'm clear. I think it's just worth mentioning to um, Terry that um, uh, in the first instance, look, just give um, clear a buzz on, on you know or, or an email um, and even if you just get a submission in very a very brief one um, because what that does is it gives you the opportunity to be heard a week or two later which gives you a little bit more time to get the details of your submission point um, refined and then you can um, speak to council to hearing uh, you know even via zoom so you don't even have to come in um, so just just give some consideration to that too. Great, thanks, Rain. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, we've got a question about the photo showing on the affluent on the road. It's ho um, horse affluent. Um, horses are included in the bylaw. Um, again, you know, I just go back to the um, point that this is really about safety. Of road users, and regardless of the type of animal, you know we want to be keeping our um, our roadways as clear as possible of effluent. Okay, we'll go to the next question here. Other councils in New Zealand have not taken the jurisdiction of Waka Um That is correct. There are other councils that haven't don't have the same setup with Waka Kotahi in terms of stock crossing. Uh, as we do. Um, that's something you'd have to contact Waka Kotahi about um, for the finer details about which which councils or districts they've um, chosen to take this route with. Um, but it is the case here uh, in Tasman. Yeah, that's probably it's worth... relatively sorry. common, sorry, Dwayne. Um, no, go for it. Yeah, uh, NZTA delegate aspects of their road management to councils uh, where it's convenient for them to do so. So where the council has um, a, a parking bylaw where they have um, they apply restrictions to parking and that's enforced through the council's bylaw um, for stock driving again that's another common one where councils around the country are delegated certain responsibilities so it's not a sweeping delegation for everything it's just certain aspects that it makes sense to yeah. okay, thanks Jamie um, we've got a question about holding sheep uh, I mean, sheep back. Um, this is, you know, I, this is one of those aspects of the draft bylaw that um, I think it's really great that we have this consultation period for to get some clarity around that. Um, that may be something that isn't practical to hold sheep back before crossing a road. Um, happy to acknowledge that and that, you know, if you're pro providing that feedback to us will help us um, help us improve the draft bylaw and increase the clarity about what kind of stock may need to be held back um, rather than just all stock. So yeah, please do put in a submission about that question. Hey Claire, um, if I might yeah. just uh, address an anonymous attendee's question sure. too around the practicality and stuff. So so Claire's acknowledged, yep, okay, probably not gonna work. And, and there are already got some great feedback from people around um, one, the impracticability and two, potentially um, unintended consequences of such a rule. I guess we'd ask you to think about what the council's trying to do is to avoid travel of um, effluent from the um, from races or um, for paddocks where stock in particular have been held for a period, um, I, you know, and 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 then you know obviously uh, release a lot of effluent and then walking that through and there's that kind of buffer zone. Uh, probably we would acknowledge it's not really necessary when stock are quickly being moved through from one paddock to another, for example. Uh, it's probably more important for, for um, when stock are being held up um, in a race, for example, after milking might be a good example of that. Um, but where that situation applies, where stock are held up against the fence next to the road for a period, um, 
you know that that is just kind of trying to re re um, reduce that travel of of um, feces and effluent into the road environment. Look, if 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 it's not applicable in some cases, we'd love to hear that. Um, if it is still applicable in terms of that holding back, and, and you can think of a better way of dealing with it, we we would love to hear that. Awesome, thanks, Dwayne. Um, could the timeline be extended? The question there, I think that's related to the question, previous question about it being um, not a great time for farmers. Um, I think probably we can't extend the timeline at this point, um, but I'd just go back to Dwayne's comment about even if you can just pop in a really quick submission just to get your name and information registered on the system, you can have a bit more time um, prior to speaking to your submission um, to put uh, more information together at that point. Um, so hopefully uh, that would help. But in order to reach our those deadlines, um, we would like to keep the keep the month long timeline as we've got it for the submission process. I don't know if yeah. you have any more you want to add to that, Dwayne? Yeah, might just look. Um, this exercise in itself is useful to find out what's going on. And we've got a, um, a report going to the regulatory committee and they're considering it next week. And, and, and that's actually not changing the timeline for consultation, but shortening the process so we can address people's concerns earlier rather than leaving it open. And I guess we can discuss with the committee at that stage, you know, that there are, um, they can, um, they could potentially extend the period if they chose to at that time, but it would mean that council couldn't close this process out um, in the next few months. It would actually end up rolling up into next year. So anyway, we can, we can certainly we can certainly raise that possibility with them and, and see what their interest is. Great, thank you. Uh, I've got a question here about scope to relax signage. I'll pick that one up. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, it's probably hard to give a sweeping answer here, but totally hear, um, hear the point. Um, I think the best thing to do would be if you're at all uncertain about your setup at the, at the crossing you're using, uh, would be to come and talk to um, to me or my team uh, who who can advise where, you know, how close to or whether those signs are acceptable in terms of the standard that, um, that's that been set. Yeah, I, I think it needs to be a, a, a case by case assessment. I'm certainly, we're not expecting everyone will need to throw out everything they've got and go and invest in new signs. That's not the intent. It's more about making sure some, some key requirements are met, you know, other signs clean do they are they the right sign to start with um are they visible will they you know if they're being used at sort of marginal marginal times in terms of of light you know are they reflective do they actually perform what they need to do to to, to um warn approaching drivers of the hazard so yeah it's a it's a possibility that um that existing signs will be okay absolutely Great, thank, thanks, Jamie. Uh, we've got a few questions here that are all around the same issue, which is the clause about not dro droving stock past a food factory or food production site. Um, that's a really good question. It's actually some, it was something that was in the previous bylaw and it's also in quite a few other stock bylaws around the country. Um, I would assume, it's in reference to dro droving stock past a meat factory. Um, but that's something that could be looked into more. If you put in a submission about it, we'd be happy to uh, to investigate whether, you know, whether or not that is a reasonable requirement or if that even is something that comes up very often. Um, I'm not sure if it would or not. Um, there's a question about it if that includes vineyards, orchards, gardens, and the like. Um, I believe that it doesn't, but that is something that I would go back and look into a bit more. Um, so I'll definitely take that take that back. And in either case, we can add some more clarity in the wording to the by, to the draft bylaw about what exactly that means um, to make sure everybody's on the same page. Yeah, thanks, Claire. One, one of the things I can probably um, 
I can probably say is that many bylaws around the country uh, were once based on a standard issue bylaw, um, and and many councils simply adopted them um, as a matter of practice, and then they kind of over time they evolved their own little tweaks to those, and and it actually feels like this one might be one of those issues where um, it has gone from something that was meant to be a nationally led standard, and and potentially has. Um, little risk or relevance to Tasman, but that's a good point we can look into. Hmm. Okay, I've got another question here about putting up signs, um, the amount of time it takes to get sheep um, from their holding point to the road. In that amount of time, signs that are put up can get stolen um, or drivers aren't taking any notice of them anyways. Um, I'm assuming because they've been up so long with no stop crossing. Um, yeah, I mean, the signs do need to be up prior to stock crossing. When exactly those signs are put up, whether it's when stock are being held or um, just more, more closely before that they're actually brought across the road, um, that would be um, up to the farmer on what works best for them, um, but when stock are being brought across the road, the signs do need to be there. Um, but yeah, again, I'm personally not not a farmer, so I can't give any. You know, I'm looking for more information about this from you, really, about what's reasonable and practicable. Um, I don't know if Jamie or Dwayne has anything else to add about that. Yeah, if 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 it's in like regards to driving along the road. Um, yeah, that's a slightly different setup in terms of signs. You, you don't have um, the static signs that you'd have at a road crossing. You have um, the guidance says there should be a, a a lead vehicle and a and a tail vehicle. So some yeah, a, a vehicle or a full a full bike or whatever at the front um, with a flashing light and a and a sign on it to warn approaching traffic of of the this moving um, flock of sheep or whatever that's heading along the road. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they are different requirements if you're driving along the road versus crossing. But yeah, I mean, in my game, there's a lot of signs that get flogged, and yeah, unfortunately, it's a it's it's a fact of life that yeah, wish we could avoid it, but we can't. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, question about the um, pilot vehicles versus walking. Um, the reason for the pilot vehicles is that um, it's quite clear to see and that there's a um, the signage and the lights would be larger than just a person walking behind stock. Um, so those, I mean, depending on if you look at that guidance, the Waka Kotahi guidance about um, what sort of pilot vehicles are required for what amount of stock. Um, that is what we're currently proposing. Um, if you don't think that's reasonable, or as Dwayne said about the previous comment, if you think there's a better way to do things, um, please do let us know, put in a submission about it, um, and we will take that into account. Yeah, yeah, um, I can say in, a, in a, another question from Sue further down about um, a short driving year where you're not going straight across the road, you might be heading down to an entrance way just that you can see right there. Um, you know, any if you are going to make a submission where you're, you're, you're challenging, I guess, what NZTA have said is best practice, please do it in a constructive way and say, look, we can't meet, we don't think that we can meet that requirement necessarily the way it's drawn because they are idealized diagrams, right? But here's what. You know, here's a situation that's typical for me, and this is how we would um, still meet the safety requirements. So, mm -hmm. adequate warning to approaching drivers um, and keeping the stock under control. You know, those, those are some of the you know the really critical fundamentals. Tell us how it can be done safely in a way that's not necessarily represented in the diagrams we've got. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thanks, Jamie. And I think that applies to all of these issues, including holding stock back 50 meters before crossing. <laughs> um, if these things aren't realistic in your situation, please do submit about it and 
<laughs> I'm sorry about my cough, and uh, and tell us why, and tell us why this is happening, um, and why it's not practicable for you, and how you might how you might deal with the situation differently and still maintain those same safety requirements. Um, Another question from. Uh, from Adrian about the traffic volumes on roads. Um, yeah, so the council will have, uh, we've got the traffic volume, so you can just request it from us if, you, if you're if you looking for it for a particular road. But I'm I'm thinking out loud if, uh, it's often easier, not many of our roads are really high volume roads in terms of a lot of traffic. So we could possibly list um, roads that do Jump up into a into a um, into a higher criteria due to the traffic volumes. So yeah, in the absence of that though, yeah, we can provide traffic volumes when we're asked. Thanks, sir. Nice comment about <laughs> feeling sorry for me coughing. I do apologize. I'm sorry. I think everybody's had colds and coughs and COVID going on. Um, yeah, it's just how it is these days, isn't it? Another um, question from Stephen was about uh, how many complaints we get about uh, stock crossings. Um, I covered it briefly earlier. We get several complaints a year, but it's mostly about the cleanliness of the of the crossings. Um, well, actually, there's a there's a lot more complaints about stock that escape from paddocks, and I'm sure um, yeah, you've all heard of some stories about about those events, they seem to be quite frequent, but in terms of the stock crossings themselves, yeah, it's more about um, the cleanliness and, and road users being concerned about um, effluent being left there. Yeah, several a year on average. Yeah. Uh, and it's worth pointing out, I think, that um, in terms of escaped stock or sort of an emergency situation like that, a lot of the elements of the bylaw don't apply. Um, yeah. So if your stock are escaped, you just need to get them back in um, regardless of getting the pilot vehicle sorted and all of that, um, and that, that is included in the bylaw. Um, Jamie and Claire, um, uh, attendee 571625 has made a comment about people um, in high-vis vests <coughs> um, waving stop signs um, and um, versus the, you know, the idea of a pilot vehicle and stuff. Do you guys mind commenting on that? The, the, the idea obviously being that maybe people walking along on high-vis vids waving stock signs is just as effective at um, creating awareness about what's got, you know, for approaching vehicles as pilot vehicle or the light or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think that goes back to the same thing about if that's how things, if that's, for example, how a farm has done things for a long time and you, know, you do have several people in high-vis jackets making it quite clear with lights, you know, meeting the same safety requirements that are in the bylaw, then you know that's something that um, you know you could write to us about in a bit more detail about why that meets the same safety requirements um, as the pilot vehicle would that has lights on it. Um, yeah, I mean, because yeah. again, it all it comes back to the reason why we have this bylaw in the first place, which is to keep road users safe. Really, um, is the key consideration. So if that's if you believe that's meeting the requirements. Um, of the bylaw, yeah, please do write in and let us know about it. Yeah, I mean, I'll, the only thing I'll add is you would be appalled at what happens on the roads. Um, you know, you talk to any, anyone you know who's a road worker and they'll share terrifying stories of, of what drivers do, you know, even when, you know, the they should have re received and seen all the warnings. Um, and I think a lot of people no longer see high-vis vests or they're distracted. The, the road's a risky place. There was, um, you know, the the reason all of these requirements seem to have tightened in recent years, uh, and it seems like there's even more signs and cones and temporary speed restrictions, is has been driven a lot by the the three deaths of road the road workers in that one crash up in the Bay of Plenty. Um, they were they were on foot. Uh, a few a few meters off to the side of the road, cleaning out the inlet to a culvert. Um, you know, seemingly safe. They had their truck parked on the side of the road, flashing light. Um, it was a hundred k an hour road, 
and and an approaching rental truck didn't see what was right in front of him and he crashed straight into their truck their truck was thrown and um killed three guys instantly and and seriously injured a couple more and so the road is generally not a very safe place for people to be that's kind of the premise of a lot of the guidelines that have been developed for you know what safe looks like on the road if, if people are there and generally the way we operate our road work sites is if people are working in or near the carriageway there has to be a temporary speed restriction there has to be a pile of cones a pile of signs a pile of flashing lights and and possibly even um you know vehicles parked to protect uh, these people so there's a lot of requirements and it seems over the top but yeah, when you talk to the families of those people, I don't think they would think it's over the top. So yeah, for that one, it's a, sorry, it's a general question, a uh, general answer. Um, doesn't totally answer the question that you were asking, but provides some context, hopefully. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. I've um, just got another comment here from Adrian about um, providing those, those traffic counts, you know, which roads have high traffic counts. Um, that's something that we can definitely look into and provide. I would think Jamie is part of is part of this. Yeah. Yeah, um, um, Claire and Jamie it would be uh, um, maybe one of the things we can do is um, get some traffic counts and estimates um, on on the um, on the consultation website for the stock control bylaw. Jamie, you'll know better. How often are those counts made for um, rural roads, or indeed? Does uh, do our counts count include all the rural roads, um, or just yep. the main? Yeah, it does. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, it varies for those really low volume um, roads where the traffic probably doesn't change much from year to year. We've got a rolling program of counting them at least once every five years. But for for the high volume roads where we are more interested in traffic growth, we'll count them annually or, or sometimes more often. Yeah, but I mean, you you guys will have all seen those tubes on your road, and you'll know how often they're counted. Yeah, so it should be once every five years. Well, good, good enough for this process to give an indication of um, yeah. what Adrian's worried about, about the, you know, where they might fit in the hierarchy. Yeah. Well, we can definitely look into doing that and providing it on the, on the consultation website. So you can have a look at that. Um, I don't see any more questions coming up uh, at this point. Um, we can wait a few minutes and you can pop your last questions in there. If you have any more, we've still got a bit of time. Um, but yeah, again, I just like to um, repeat that you know this is this is why we're doing the whole consultation process, and we know this is an issue that you know can likely affect um, you know how people, how farmers go about their you know their daily work, and um, that's why we're doing this. This, this whole this month long consultation process and you know we do want to hear from you and it really is our intention that we um, create a bylaw that in the end um, is usable and reasonable and makes sense to people um, but that also makes sure that we um, are doing our best to keep the road clean and above all keep everybody safe on the road um, so yeah please do put in your submissions um, and you can always speak to them as well Claire, there's another couple of questions there. Are there a few more? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I um, I can't tell you if we've we have estimated the number of permit applications required under this bylaw. Um, I don't know if Jamie, you wanted to speak to that one. Yeah, well, that's a that's a really good yeah really good question. I mean, we we. We don't have the intent of wanting to um, put every farmer through a permit process for every crossing. You know, no one wants that. Um, so, you know, it would be really good to hear if you feel we've got that trigger level right. Um, you know, and we, we don't want to be repeating permit processes, you know, every time someone wants to move some stock. Um, yeah. So yeah, I know. Yeah, Very good question that, about mm. you know the efficiency of the use of everyone's time. So it's not the intent is to be overly bureaucratic. No one wants that. Yeah. Yeah. 
more paperwork is not anybody's <laughs> goal here. Um, I think it's to add just to add to what Jamie said um, about that, that applying for the permit in the in the draft bylaw where it says that a permit is required, that permit is not per activity or per crossing. It's for a period of time for the same sort of activity. So it's not something that should have to be repeated over and over again. It would just be for that period of time. We've just had some questions previous to this webinar on that on that issue, on if it's something that would need to be applied for over and over again for the same thing, and it's not. Last question about, this might be a good one. No, we propose to remove sheep poo. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah that's, um, that's a good question. It's something that we've talked about. Um, we haven't specified anything like that. about the process yeah. of removing sheep poo. Uh, it's whatever works. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, whatever works. And also, again, just going back to the intent of the bylaw, which is to keep the road relatively clean, not have a lot of effluent washed into the waterways and make sure it's not a hazard. And so creating like a slippery surface or, you know, a nuisance of it getting all over people's wheels and stuff um, for the public. So if that's not happening, then it's probably a pretty minimal issue. Um, so just yet, yeah, in terms of the usability of the bylaw, just going back to the intent, um, I think is an important point. Yeah, I, I clear. I, I'm going to um, just restate that to uh, emphasize it. The bylaw um, has a bunch of things it wants people to do, but fundamentally, when it comes to cleaning effluent off the road, for example, it's trying to keep the road free of nuisance um, and to ensure that um, if it is a nuisance or the way you cross or drove, if it's going to present, um, you know, fecal matter getting into waterway, it's an obligation on the farmer to manage that nuisance, um, which is which is perfectly reasonable because there are other road users that need to make use of that road as well. It is not intended that every bit of fecal matter on a road yeah. from sheep being driven, driven down a, you know, a, a, a road or anything like that needs to be cleaned up if it doesn't present a nuisance. And it doesn't, um, and it doesn't present any risk to the water bodies around the road. Then you go on your merry way. Okay. Um, there's another good question from yeah. Stephen here about the um, yeah, the practicality of achieving, you know, the the sight distance to these signs and the warning distance. Um, the yeah, it, it is about getting a balance, and there'll be some roads where it it just seems impossible. To get that three times the speed limit, and um, in fact, a better way of looking at it, um, I know the speed limit term has been used in the NZTA guidelines, but um, a better way is looking at the operating speed. So, what what, what speeds are vehicles travelling around those curves? Because if they're really tight curves, they won't be travelling at hundred. You'd hope. Um, so, this is kind of a we can capture aspects of the answer to that in the bylaw and the guidelines associated with the bylaw, but it might be, um, if you're really struggling with that, it might be more of a, a, a site specific question. And, um, you know, one of our engineers will come out and and, um, and agree and provide advice on where the best location is. Yeah, I mean, our traffic management guys have to deal with this all the time when they're setting up work sites and balancing between having the signs too far away from where the hazard actually is versus not achieving the site distance. And it's kind of a sort specific answer each time. Yeah, and just to, just to add to that, I think what it's really about is stopping distance as well. You know, we want the distance there that's recommended is so that people have time to see the sign, recognize what's going on, slow down, and stop before actually ending up, um, you know, in, in the same place as the stock. So. Yeah, in terms of yeah, I think just going back to what Jamie said, if it's if if it's a hundred k road, but people are actually only going thirty k because the the turns are so tight, um, then yeah, that might not be that might not really be practical. Um, but just bear in mind that it also has slightly different requirements when the road does have a lot of bends in it, um, not just in terms of the stopping distance and the, and the sign the distance for the signs. Um, but also in terms of 
fencing and how often posts need to be put up, reflective posts and things like that change if the road has a lot of curves in it as well. Um, got another question here about um, how uh, permits or how long permits last for. Um, and that a lot of information is required of the farmers in terms of dates and times. Um, <clears throat> Jamie might be able to talk a little bit more about the length that permits tend to last for for, for council. Um, and in terms of stating the dates and times, um, that would just be, you know, if it's a regular activity that you want to that you want to be doing with the stock, whether it's along a road or crossing a road, um, just the general when you do this, what sort, how many, how many days a week, days a month is this happening? What time of day is it happening? Um, not necessarily the exact time and date of every single crossing, if that makes sense. Did you wanna add any more, Jamie, about how long permits last for? Um, no, we probably can't answer that on the hoof, but... Um, That's no, something that uh, but, um, uh, I come back to my comments earlier. We we don't want this to be a mm -hmm. painful exercise, not at all. So I think we'll just uh, we'll just take that on board to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Can barriers be used? Question. Another question from Sue here. For those non-direct short droppings, how often safety is a good barrier on a quiet road yes. for such shifts? Uh, I mean, I, I can't answer that. I, I, yeah. uh, I'm just not sure. I don't know quite what, what's meant by barriers. So, so you might be able to yeah. give us a bit more detail, hopefully, about that. Yeah, sorry, same, same from me. I'm not, I just need a bit more information before I can answer that. Hey, um, Dwayne Fitzgerald. So, um, if, I mean, um, sounds like you might be quoting a specific scenario or situation you're familiar with. So, so, you know, um, if you've got any photos that you could flick in to, to us to help us understand what you're suggesting, that would be, that'd be awesome. Um, so Steve, Stephen's question Stevens. about the, um, oh, you know, just about the consistency of applying standards and discretion. Yeah, I, it would be best for any, um, any advice that you're given by a council staff member or, or roading engineer to be documented, um, get it in writing uh, if, if that's a concern, certainly. And that's, that's what we would endeavor to do. Um, I can answer the Cherise question. Cherise, yeah. About, uh, about, no, the answer is no. I mean, the, the council are the ones who will put delineation um, on its rural roads uh, where that's required. So we're not expecting boundary fences to, to have reflectors added to them. No, I, I think I think what you're asking about is the fencing requirements um, for droving stock along the road margin. Or oh, is this temporary fencing? Yeah, um, and there is a line in the bylaw that um, every X number of meters, uh, there needs to be a reflective fence post. Yeah. Uh, and that frequency is cl you know, closer on roads with that have a lot of hills or turns in them, um, again, because of that visibility. So it's not talking about boundary boundary fences um, for the paddock. So, oh, so this that. is, yeah, okay. So this is um, using the road as a race um, yeah. or, or grazing the margin. Yeah, no, certainly, you know, if you're putting new hazards into the road environment, uh, yeah, you've got to... Um, mitigate against that so giving people adequate warning with reflectors or, or, or things telling them about these hazards is quite important yeah um in terms of got peter's question here about how flexible is council about not about having a one-size-fits-all rule for every type of road um i think you know, I mean, this is really in terms of having a one size fits all for all, of every rule, except for perhaps have you know heavily used state highways. Um, I understand where that point is coming from, but I think every you know every road is potentially can have quite different situations on them, and in terms of speed and 
just you know the amount of hills or turns or uh, I think each situation can be quite unique so I think we council wouldn't really want to take a one-size-fits-all approach here because I think that would lower the level of safety that we could ensure for for road users and wouldn't necessarily have the best approach for each um, each situation. Yeah, I, I, I'll add to that. The um, I guess there's a minimum standard that always applies and, and you can always go up from that standard and um, yeah, maybe in some cases that's, that's required. Um, yeah, the, the key is is consistency. Um, so, you know, that's been shown time and again. And that, that's why we, you know, internationally there are standardised signs and, and certainly in New Zealand, um, you know, giving people, giving road users consistent information and clues about the, the hazards that they're approaching is, is really important. Um, but, oh, you know, on the flip side, we're not aiming to be over the top and every site and every situation has some uniqueness about it. Um, and that's why, yeah, the, the, the discussion might need to continue and in getting into details about specific sites um, where that's required. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that's a complete answer to that question. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's something we can look into a bit more though um, and do a bit more thinking about. Um, Who's, I'm sorry, Sue, I, I'm not sure what Sue's talking, saying when she says that um, 9.2 refers to barriers for crossings, not short drives. That might be in reference to a previous question. No, this is putting us so using gates um, at at crossings. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if we'll give you an answer here now. I think we'll, we'll park. We'll park that one. Yeah. Um, okay. Adrian's got a question about: Is Tasman currently reviewing speed limits to align with Vision Zero and Mega Maps and a safe and appropriate speeds? Uh, the answer is yes. The council is in the process right now of um, drafting a speed management plan that, um, yeah, the intention is to align with Road to Zero goals and safe and appropriate speeds. Yeah, just to yeah. um, just to clarify um, on that one. Uh, the, the council will be going out and consulting on that plan at some stage in the future. Um, uh, but there's a lot of discussions we have to have internally mm. with our council first. And, 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 and um, before we get there, and strictly speaking, probably um, probably not related to the stock control bylaw directly. Yeah. Great. I've got another question from Sheree about um the reasons behind the max numbers of stock quoted in the bylaw um yeah again this is those are coming from waka kotahi best practice road safety standards so that would be about the length of time i mean the amount of road that's being taken up um by the stock um again if you wanted more information on that you can also feel free to get in touch with me personally um or jamie to get more information um, on those types of questions um, i think I think for the moment we've covered sort of a lot of key topics here. Um, if there's any, if anybody has any more um, sort of specific questions or want, you know, just points of clarification um, as you go through thinking about putting in a submission, um, do get in touch. We'll try to answer those questions as well as possible. Um, I think if Jamie and Dwayne are happy here, we might um, think about wrapping up. The questions seem to be uh, slowing down. Um, if there's any sort of closing comments that Jamie or Dwayne wanted to put in about this? No, I just, um, yeah, there's been some really good questions and um, yeah, thanks for participating and throwing those at us. Um, it's always good to um, to have a conversation like this and, and hopefully both sides have learned a bit more. So yeah, thanks everybody. Yeah, I just I pretty much Jamie's covered it. Um, and just restate, look, we're, we're pretty keen <laughs> We're pretty keen to get this right. What, something that works for the community, that's safe, um, that addresses the new requirements we do have around kind of making sure our fresh water stays fresh. fresh. Um, and, and pretty keen to hear what people have got to say. Um, hopefully people have got from this that we're genuinely interested in hearing about the situations and scenarios that might apply and you know where things might not work for people. So, so really keen to hear about those. Um, 
um, as we progress with the, the stock control bylaw. And thanks everybody for your time. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, and for me, I, I'll probably be the person that you'll be getting in touch with um, as a first point of contact if you do have any more questions. So feel free to send me an email or give me a call. I'm happy to talk through any more questions with you and try to answer them the best I can. Um, and in terms of the things that we talked about today, such as getting um, this numbers of the volume of traffic on certain roads, um, length of time for a permit, that sort of question. Um, I will definitely look into that a bit more and we can provide some questions and answers on the consultation website to answer those for you. Um, yeah, don't forget that it closes on the 1st of August. Um, so feel free to put in that submission and, um, and yeah, click, make sure you click if you want to speak to your presentation and we'll get in touch with you about a date and time for that. So thanks everybody for coming along.